Welcome back to our new part of the episode about contract-based testing. We and Bart had two nice discussions about what we see, what we find about this. Now it's time for the lack of our personal experience to do a small wrap-up. So during the discussions, uh, we uh, found a couple of interesting points. For me, one of the very interesting questions popped up during those discussions was, are we testing the structure of a message? Or are we testing the functionality together with, uh, with the structure? Where is, what is the contract? What are we focusing those contract-based tests? And from my research, from talking to other people, it looks like the consensus is shifting a little bit more towards purely the structure, where I personally don't have that much of a value most of the time. On the other hand, Bart uh, has, you probably have a little bit more tendency to think about a bigger replacement for the functional integrated tests, which is for me interesting, but potentially there are, well, in any case, we need to definitely uh, be careful about what we define by contract tests, how far do they go? Yeah, yeah, no, and, and, and definitely in this uh, uh, like spectrum of pure structure tests and pure functional tests, I, uh, I think because uh, we, we've had several discussions on this after our uh, friendly uh, discussions, um, on that uh, aspect, the balance between uh, how far is it a structural test and how far is it a, a functional test. Well, I, I agree that it, it really is about the the, uh, the structural messaging between two systems. It is not as structure based as API specs. So I think it's actually somewhere between a fully shared test case and somewhere uh, and and a pure structural analysis and I'm not quite sure yet where in that balance it is because I personally think that uh, th there is more value if you place them closer to the functional test um, but yeah that might also be, be harder to, to set up and it, it really depends on uh, circumstance and your method of collaboration uh, between the different teams um, so yeah, I, I think that was uh, uh, an important part that we uh, brought up earlier. And I think the uh, the other important point that I can also segue into uh, easily now is that in the end, it really is about communicating between teams and uh, uh, making sure that uh, any, any changes are uh, properly discussed between the consumers and the producers around such an, an interface. Um, so I think that's an important takeaway uh, of the discussion so far and I guess uh, the other uh, interesting part is that like conceptually we both see the value but we really haven't seen this, this successful implementation yet and especially not a successful implementation combined with remaining enthusiasm <laughs> So, yes. Yeah. Yes, that's true. I think uh, yeah, the communication is very important point, and it's always uh, important to remember that the power, at least, uh, of the consumer-based, consumer-driven contract-based test is in the consumer communicated with the producer. So both sides need to have interest, at least certain degree of interest for this uh, technique to start to shine. I would like to also um, reiterate a bit on the discussions that we had when I started to talk about the assumption horizon. And I said, okay, my, for me, uh, one of the problems is that uh, with, without contract tests, we're focusing on just testing our component in isolation with uh, assumption, uh, assumption boundary, assumption horizon around our service. And with the contract testing as best with the good uh, results, we're br bringing it to the next step. So, two services. And your point, very good point, was that if we go further, if we are consistent with implementing this technique, then we can basically have a large chain of these uh, tests, of these contract tests that give us certain uh, reliability. And I think that's a good, very good point, but the danger here, I think, important conceptually, that then we're starting to lose the power of consumer-driven, because consumer, we are consumer of our first collaborator. But the, the contra contract test, consumer-driven contract test of that second collaborator with the next one, 
will not be probably, they will start to diffuse our concerns. And the examples I'm often thinking is often we would have APIs that have flexible things like key value par pairs, uh, metadata or annotations that might not be very important or interesting to most of the uh, services involved in the chain where we're reaching it from some kind of source, but they can be crucial for us. So for us, they would be important, but in the, in the middle, they, will, they might lose their importance. So that's something I think important to remember about when talking about how this whole thing will work, especially in the, in the involved microservices architecture, when you have very small collaborating services, usually with longer chains of uh, events or data streams. Yeah. So, so you're saying because your the actual like um, consumer producer relationship spans over multiple services. Just having that um, uh, contract between uh, the two neighboring services will not uh, guarantee that uh, the actual uh, involved parties properly talk to each other. Because there's lots of chains of just passing it on. They, they, they will be talking pro properly, gonna... but they might lose some information yeah. or yeah. might uh, stop sending some information you are cr uh, crucially interested, especially if it's not they are not yeah. aware of that because of that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, and especially if you have multiple steps, it would be easy for someone to think, oh, wait, why are we passing it on? We don't even need it. Let's oh, they might even know, but they will not get it from the contract testing. They need to go through all the chain no. again manually, the same way yeah. as you do without contract-based testing. Yeah. This another yeah. way. Yeah. So this yeah, is, this is, is I think to... it's impo an important yeah. limitation to just keep in mind. Yeah. It's not a silver bullet. Bullet yeah. It can help in certain cases, not yeah. always. Yeah, and, and that bring, brings it basically back to... Um, is it worth the in, the investment, um, basically, because uh, there there is only limited uh, benefit, uh, and is that limited benefit worth the the extra uh, investment that you need to do to get it set up? Um, yeah, I think I think nowadays maybe the technical setup again is not that difficult. We have uh, a relatively evolved evolved tooling around it. Uh, lots of uh, articles, blog posts, examples, how to implement on the technical level. And that's also a little bit uh, difficult because when I try to search something on the internet, uh, uh, find some guidance, how do we, where do we need to focus? It's not very much information, at least I can find easily. Most of the time it's about the concept or the very high level, okay, what, uh, what it is about. And then you, how you do it with Pact or Spring contracts, uh, how the, however it's called, and that's it not about those nitty how to make it actually work in which context will it work in which it might give you less benefit what to be aware of that yeah. i'm a little bit and, missing and what's the organizational change you need to implement to get it to work properly yeah organizational yeah in which organization would it fit would it uh, less fit and yeah. if you want yeah. it to fit what what will be the sacrifices where maybe yeah so and in, in a yeah. sense i also like the, what that you mentioned that it might be a red herring sometimes because, uh, yeah. as I said, as we are now discussing that there are limitations, so it will not give you 100% confidence. So you're just saying, okay, yeah, we'll just implement contract testing and it will solve our problems. It, it's not really the case. It might even it introduce full sense of security, full sense of security sometimes. But on the other hand, I also very much like what you said, that it can be an easier sell. So it can uh, relieve some fear of angst when we're starting to distribute our systems, how we, will, uh, how we will ensure that things are not breaking apart. Even though maybe it's not yeah. always the best uh, tool, but at least it gives us some way to frame our efforts around, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think all those things really sum up well what we've dis discussed so, so far with a couple of new um, added... Uh, angles so so Nicola, what's your main your main takeaway from our discussion so far yes my my main takeaway is that contract testing uh, consumer driven is not something that i would use by default i think it's more situational uh, tool that can be probably very useful in some uh, circumstances but not necessarily not for every microservices implementation you need it 
And that's in the contrast yeah. what I think I hear. I think it's a little bit oversold. It's not as right. self-evident as like writing automated tests because at some scale you will not get away from some sort of automated test. It's not as self-evident even as microservice architecture because at some scale it would really be difficult to have well modularized monolith. So it's natural to think about microservices architecture at some point. Maybe you do some esoteric, but it's natural. This is not the case, I think, with the contract-based testing. It's a good tool, right. potentially, but not for everyone and not uh, by default. Yeah, so it's more like something like, uh, for example, screenshot testing, which is a, a great way to, to test interfaces, but you don't always need yeah, it. Yeah, property so testing, like a, a... mutation testing, so they can be awesome right. in, yeah, exactly. very, very, in uh, some niche areas where they will be just like uh, uh, a big game changer, but not for everyone. Not by default, yeah. not everywhere. And what do cool. you think? Yeah, so um, we've uh, we've discussed this uh, heavenly, and we've we've done some some research and some how do you call it offline discussions as well. Um, and yeah, what um, what it ha has meant for me is that actually I've I've gone become extra intrigued uh, and and interested in in figuring out how this can work well. So I, I'd really like to reiterate uh, the call for action that we put out there uh, last week that I, I'd love to get a, 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 a pragmatic functioning success story from someone. So uh, just um, if you have uh, the killer story for uh, uh, contract testing, you, uh, anyone watching, Please reach out to us because I I'd love to hear it. I, I I really think that there might be something we're missing, and I think that it might be more awesome. But on the other hand, it might also just be a situational tool that is, um, and that's of course also really valuable for those yeah. situations. I think I think I think I think it's good. It's yeah. uh, basically it's good to know when where when it works well. And then you can frame around, you can sometimes push the boundary a little bit, but it's not something that like as universal as unit, unit test, especially. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Okay. So I think, so I guess, um, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up, uh, uh, like that. And then if we get someone, uh, who would love, would like to, to share their experience with us, I think we'll, I guess we'll t turn it into a new episode maybe. Yes. And then. I think next week we'll handle uh, what makes a good test uh, or a bad test. I think that's uh, our, our next subject. And uh, in the meantime, we've got some time to, uh, and you've got some time to uh, experiment with contract tests and tell us how awesome it is. <laughs> yes. Looking forward. Excellent. Good. Thank bye -bye. you. Okay. And by the way, again, I forgot to turn my camera on at some point, so <laughs> I will <No>. have again. <laughs>